Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Rashad Aita. So he's in his master's uh, thesis in experimental surgery, and he is supervised by uh, doctors Gao, Harvey, and Gauri. And uh, I'm super excited to hear his talk, which is entitled uh, Spinal Cord Injury Associated Heterotopic Ossification, a Novel Mouse Model. So take it away, Rashad. Just to make sure you guys can see the screen and uh, the audio. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rashad. Okay, perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rashad Aita. I will be presenting to you my uh, project entitled Spinal Cord Injury Associated Heterotopic Ossification, a Novel Mouse Model. About 400,000 individuals worldwide currently live with a spinal cord injury, and about 90,000 of them are here in Canada with up to 4,000 new cases occurring each year in Canada. The uh, main cause of spinal cord injury is a traumatic one via motor vehicle accident and a fall. Spinal cord injury, as you can imagine, is a severe injury, and the it's associated with severe and serious complications, unfortunately, such as quadriplegia, paraplegia, chronic pain, bowel and bladder dysfunction, and decubitus ulcers. One increasingly recognized complication of SCI is a heterotopic ossification, which is the abnormal formation of bone where bone does not usually exist in the soft tissues, especially in the muscles and tendon uh, near uh, joints. HO occurs in up to 50% of SCI cases, and it's associated with pain, joint stiffness, nerve and blood vessel compression, and a restriction of the range of motion of the affected HO joint, and overall impaired quality of life. Unfortunately, current treatments are limited to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, bisphosphonates, and radiotherapy, which attempt to target the early inflammatory phase of HO. However, it's, uh, these treatments are often non-specific and are uh, often have off-target side effects, uh, which warrants the need for further investigation of the pathophysiology of HO. However, uh, the main problem is that there is a scarcity of relevant animal models for this condition and by extension the unknown pathogenic mechanism. Therefore, our project, um, our project's goal is to develop and establish a novel and clinically relevant animal model for HO with our hypothesis that a combined spinal cord injury and a musculotendinous injury leads to heterotopic ossification at the site of musculotendinous injury. We performed um, our experiments on uh, black wild type female 10 week old mice and uh, our surgeries were performed by induction of an SCI through spinal cord transection at T10 and T11 vertebra, followed by a musculotendinous injury on these same mice through compression of the quadriceps musculotendinous tissue indicated here. Following surgery and until the experimental endpoint, we provide post-operative care. Um, to manually express the, the, bladder, the bladders which are blocked um, following a spinal cord injury and we provide soft food to uh, permit easier access for these paraplegic mice as well as um, daily rehydration through uh, subcutaneous injections. Following euthanasia and harvesting of the, of the hind legs we perform micro CT histomorphometry and uh, 3D render 3D reconstructions of these hind legs for analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. Following micro CT, we perform histology and immunohistochemistry on paraffin and methylmethacrylate embedded samples. Moving on to the results, our one week radiological results uh, show that our control SCI and MTI show no obvious abnormalities in the soft tissue area where we would supposedly perform our musculotendinous injury. However, in the SCI and MTI region where we combine these injuries, we find a region of diffuse densities uh, at, co-localizing at the site of the musculotendinous injury. Looking at the four-week mice, um, we find similar results with no obvious abnormalities in this region. However, in the SCI and MTI mice at four weeks, we find large, dense, uh, bony structures um, that that uh, appear. And this shows that it's a progression from one week to four week where we have some sort of an active process ongoing. And this was uh, corroborated by our um, quantification through CTN of the uh, HO volumes. 
Moving on to our histological results, four weeks after surgery, we performed von Kossa and toluidine blue staining. Von Kossa staining uh, the phosphate in the hydroxyapatite uh, uh, mineral and bone black. And here we see uh, a large structure, bony structure, it appears in the soft tissue area, um, um, which is indicative of uh, abnormal bone formation presence. Looking at the ALP, which is alkaline phosphatase, an early osteoblast activity marker, and and this was positive uh, at the contours of this uh, of this abnormal bone, as shown in von Kossa, and this shows us that we have uh, osteoblast activity at the front of this of this uh, HO uh, lesion, therefore um, substantiating that there is active bone deposition occurring. When we move on to the trap staining tartrate resistant acid phosphatase, which is an osteoclast activity marker. Uh, these some some osteoclast activity uh, osteoclastic cells were present in the inside of the bone marrow of this abnormal bone, uh, lining uh, the 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 bone, and uh, this shows that we have uh, bone resorption occurring. Uh, now that we've established, we've developed and established um, our animal model, which was the first step of our project. Uh, our future directions and our second step mainly is to utilize this model to st substantiate the link of, the, of an abnormal nerve response following spinal cord injury and how that links to the trigger of resident mesenchymal stem cells to induce HO. And we are interested in certain neurogenic, androgenic uh, markers, as well as other chondrogenic and osteogenic marker to further um, uh, strengthen uh, our body of evidence towards uh, how this abnormal bone formation and characterizing its its intricacies. Uh, following this, we will perform a linear regression analysis uh, to substantiate the correlation between abnormal bone formation and uh, the um, upregulation or downregulation of certain neurogenic uh, factors, and how uh, and how that is uh, correlated to progression of HO from one week uh, to four weeks. So for the clinical significance of our model, our project is establishing a novel and clinically relevant model since uh, previous models do use a spinal cord injury. However, they prefer, they use um, a uh, muscle injury, which is induced by injection of a cardiotoxin, which is extracted from ve a snake venom. And as you can imagine, that is not the most common predisposing factor towards muscle injury, especially in the clinic. And uh, our mouse model will serve as a valuable tool to investigate the pathophysiology associated with HO to hopefully shed some light on the um, on the uh, physiological mechanism of um, the injuries that are occurring in these polytrauma patients that involve the spinal cord and musculoskeletal tissues. And eventually our findings can uncover some hidden relationships among nerve and tendon and bone um, in, in our model which could hopefully be extended to um, to human patients so that we can provide potential biomarkers for early diagnosis and prophylaxis and eventually molecular targets for effective therapy. So I'd like to acknowledge my supervisors, Dr. Chan Gao, Dr. Rahul Gauri, and Dr. Edward Jerry Harvey and our teams of students and research uh, assistants, which were crucial to culminating all this uh, results and all this uh, research, as well as the Animal Research Division of the RIMHC. Um, I'd like to acknowledge also these funding agencies. Here are my references. Uh, thank you for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Rashad. This was a very, very informative and interesting uh, presentation. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, we'll be taking any kinds of questions uh, from the audience now. You can either just turn on, yes, uh, Dr. Wine. Great. So that was a terrific presentation, really interesting work um, and a, a lovely model that you've developed. I'm just wondering, so, you know, how does it relate? So I, I liked what you said about the, the ways that they were doing this before by injecting venom, which isn't a, a common way of, of developing musculoskeletal injury. Um, how do you how do you foresee this or when do you think it's going to be ready to look at this translational aspect of testing therapies? Because I know there is interest in both you know molecular therapies like you described for this, but also other minimally invasive opportunities um, using things like focused ultrasound um, and that to potentially um, treat HO in these patients. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. It's a wonderful question. Uh, well, really, in our case, what we're really interested in is specifically the neuronal involvement, how uh, the invasion of certain uh, types of neurons, if they are required at all for abnormal bone formation to, to, to proceed. So what we're looking at is certain uh, neuropeptides that are being released by uh, the hypothesized um, innervating structures. And we're hopefully looking at trying to uh, inhibit some of these peptides and see its effect on abnormal bone formation. And obviously, you know, once once bone has mineralized, there's not really much you can do except surgical excision. So we're trying to, we're, we're more leaning on prophylaxis and preventative measures in the early stages of HO. And um, yeah, so that's basically our focus, how to leverage uh, the um, neuronal component of this disease and hopefully find something uh, something uh, for, for the patients. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Sure. Yeah, I have one question. Um, wonderful model, Sasha and Rashad. I mean, it was very, very nice to see uh, how you're able to replicate uh, the extent to what is found in the clinic in your mouse model. I just had a question on the ectopic calcification. So you, I guess you're you're leaning towards the fact that it's mostly hydroxy apatite crystals that are formed based on the, the bone development. But is, is that always associated in ectopic calcification in the clinic? Are there other calcium deposits that occur, like the other types of calcium crystals that develop uh, in the clinic? And is this possible to be uh, investigated in your model? Wonderful question. Um, in the process, while we were refining our surgeries, uh, we first involved only muscle, where we did the muscle injury. And then we compared it to muscular tendinous tissue, where there is a tendon component. And we found that when we injured the muscle in the context of a spinal cord injury, that muscle would mineralize more likely than it would ossify. So we would find discrete regions of small mineral deposit. We've yet to do the composite analysis to actually analyze what mineral we're seeing here, if it's um, if it has an organic portion, uh, if the the um, the area affected has an organic portion of bone, or is it mostly inorganic? So we we've still yet to understand uh, the intricacies of that mineralization. But what we've seen here specifically is if there is tendon contribution in the injury, we find it's more likely that it ossifies and turns into, um, you could say, bone proper where it has bone marrow and um, some active hematopoiesis. So that's still something that we're trying to investigate. And that's actually a wonderful question. Thank you. Congratulations, good luck. Thank you. Thank you, any other questions? If not, I think we can uh, move on and I'll pass the mic to Dr. Mwali then. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Aida. And thank you, uh, Rashad, for that wonderful presentation. I look forward to seeing what happens to that model, a really nice uh, model. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, a wonderful scientist uh, and a great, great uh, uh, friend, uh, Dr. Carrie Wine, and uh, our postdoc, uh, Dr. Zachary Fishman. So, uh, Professor Wine is a Susan and William Holland Chair in Musculoskeletal Research at Sunnybrook uh, Health Sciences uh, in Toronto. She is a senior scientist and the director of the Holland Bone and Joint Research Program at Sunnybrook uh, Research Institute. And also, she's also a full professor in the Department of Surgery, uh, Institute of Biomedical Engineering and Institute of Medical Sciences at the University of Toronto. Uh, she received a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Queen's University and a PhD from University of uh, California, Berkeley, University of California, San Francisco in uh, bioengineering. Uh, the focus of her work is basically, is mostly uh, clinically translational bioengineering research. And uh, uh, Professor Wine's uh, research, it integrates biomechanical analysis with basic science, preclinical and clinical investigations, which includes a lot of extensive work in uh, 
a lot of computational uh, image analysis, machine learning, microimaging, and finite element uh, modeling techniques. So HAWIC uh, also incorporates uh, design, simulation, evaluation, and clinical translation of novel, less minimally invasive surgical techniques and devices. And uh, so uh, the other talk will be given by uh, uh, Dr. Zachary Fishman, who is a PhD, uh, a postdoc uh, fellow in the orthopedic biomechanics lab at the Sunny Brooks uh, uh, Research Institute working under the supervision of Professor Wine and uh, Professor uh, Jeff uh, Fiaco. Uh, he has a background in mechanical and materials engineering and industrial experience in manufacturing and new technology development. Uh, he has expertise also in image analysis and additive manufacturing with a, uh, with a focus uh, on developing new 3D planning solutions for craniofacial reconstruction. Uh, Dr. Fishman's uh, work focuses on the generation of accurate 3D facial morphological models from 2D photographs and physical templates for cartilage and born uh, from 3D uh, face models. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to your presentations, uh, uh, Professor Wine. It's all yours. So I'm hoping everyone can see uh, my screen. Hang on, let me just make sure I can see it. Yeah, we can see. Okay. So thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so today I'm going to talk about addressing issues in craniomaxillofacial reconstruction, imaging, modeling, planning, and experimental testing and innovation. And it's going to be a lot more computational heavy um, than the last presentation. So I hope that's okay with everyone. So musculoskeletal or bone and joint disorders, as you all know, affect over 1.7 billion individuals and are the leading cause of disability worldwide. In the Holland Bone and Joint Program at Sunnybrook in Toronto, we have over 30,000 ambulatory visits annually and 6,000 operations, and we follow patients through the continuum of care. So as such, our research needs to address how to best treat our patients. Specifically, how can we answer clinical questions and address clinical needs by conducting discovery research and innovation and translating our findings back to impact clinical practice? So I'm going to start off first by giving you a brief introduction to the lab in the form of a one minute elevator pitch. So it's a format which I've encouraged many of our trainees as well as our residents and fellows to put together. So I thought I should have one too. So the focus of the work we're doing in the orthopedic biomechanics lab is clinically translational musculoskeletal bioengineering research. In this, I work with scientists, engineers, clinicians, and allied health professionals to better understand how bone tissue, specifically in the spine, is affected by cancer and cancer treatments, and to develop, evaluate, and clinically translate new minimally invasive technologies for the treatment of spinal metastases. We also have developed new approaches and technologies to improve fracture healing and to more rapidly ensure appropriate placement of orthopedic and craniomaxillofacial hardware. We use 3D image analysis, computational modeling, and machine learning to better direct craniomaxillofacial reconstruction and combine new technologies and education toward improving surgical teams, virtual care, and rehabilitation. But for today's talk, I'm going to focus on our work solely in craniomaxillofacial reconstruction. <coughs> Excuse me. The complexity of the human skeleton is most, perhaps most evident in the craniomaxillofacial bones. The biomechanics of this structure remain much less well understood than the spine or long bones, and modeling can help us to better understand the biomechanics of these complex bone structures, but accurate modeling requires high resolution in both meshing and mapping of material properties, as well as accurate representation of loads and boundary conditions. As such, I'll start this talk today discussing image processing algorithms that we've implemented to restore the accuracy of CT-derived thin bone geometry and intensity, yielding robust models of complex bone structures that can be used, we believe, to represent physiologic behavior. A majority of human skeletal FE modeling uses CT data generated at resolutions available from clinical scanners. It's evident in this imaging data of a human sinus bone how a loss of resolution can impact our ability to visualize and model thin bone structures. 
So in quantifying the impact of resolution, at a voxel size of 488 microns, cortical bone thickness measurements increased an average of uh, increased by you know 60 to 250 percent, and average scan intensity decreased by 30 to 50 percent as compared to images of smaller voxel sizes. So creating FE models from these original and downsample scans we found that cortical thickness and intensity were both significantly related to maximum principal strain. So what can we do about these issues with thin bone resolution? We know that severe errors in geometry and material properties result at low resolution due to blurring. But high resolution scans deliver a lot of radiation, they can be difficult to acquire of large objects, and they can result in huge files that can be really hard to handle. So we needed to consider how can we restore submillimeter bone geometry and intensity information in clinical CT images by using post-reconstruction image processing. So we came up with the idea that knowing what the non-blurred profile of cortical bone should look like, the question is, can we estimate it based on the observed profile in low resolution CT images? That is, can we de-blur the images? So correcting thickness and intensity in an entire CT image data set can be achieved by de-blurring or deconvolving to the extent that an exact point spread function can be measured. So a point spread function, or PSF, is how an infinitely small and infinitely high intensity single point appears in a given image. In reality, this PSF is estimated, and noise amplification needs to be managed because in reality, it's always present. So to do this, we developed a generalized model of the blurring process as a convolution operation. The model uses information about the range of intensities found in cortical bone and assumes a cortical bone profile as a rectangular function with a PSF estimated as a normalized Gaussian. We then used inverse fitting optimization to solve for the unknown variables, so the width, intensity, and sigma of the Gaussian. So using this approach, can we de-blur these CT images? We found that deblurring correctly estimates the linear profiles of thin cortical bone structure and enables estimation of 3D point spread functions from CT clinical imaging data. And we can apply iterative, 3D iterative deconvolution algorithms, so like Lucy Richardson, for example, or MRN, MRNSD, using these estimated 3D point spread functions. So how did it work? So in validation done with Delrin, Teflon, and water equivalent plastic, we imaged a total of 31 phantoms with varied cortical thickness, trabecular thickness, and scan orientations. What we found was deep blurring had a huge impact in reducing the error, both in terms of geometry, so the estimated thickness, and the cortical bone intensity, where in the deep blurred phantoms, cortical intensity and geometry were equivalent to the true measures. So that's pretty easy because it's a phantom. So what happened next? We looked at excised pieces of bone from clinically stand cadaveric human skull. We re-imaged these pieces then on micro CT at 13.7 micron voxel size to give high resolution data, which we used to acquire gold standard measurements of intensity and geometry. The deep blurring algorithm we found was able to estimate both intensity and geometry similar to the micro CT data. And that was for both trabecular bones sandwiched between two cortices, so as you see in the skull, and in thin cortical regions like you might find in the sinus. Profile corrections were also shown to allow accurate estimation of the 3D point spread function. So shown here are axial slices from a zygomatic bone and their 3D reconstructions, which highlights the improvements gained through deblurring. So overall, deblurring yielded a 68% reduction in thickness errors and 73% reduction in intensity errors of thin cortical bone versus the original images as compared to the micro CT data measurements. So this is what I really like to have is visually what you can see here is that deblurring applied to a full skull allows restoration of, of geometry and intensity of highly blurred some millimeter bone features in clinical CT data image data sets using 3D iterative deconvolution. And most specifically, if you can, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but you can see these sinus bones that really were had disappeared in the before image. And you can see that they really show up quite nicely now in this um, deep blurred imaging. So using our established pipeline to extract solid models from CT imaging data, we're able now to generate accurate FE model geometries. And the next step in this process requires the application of material properties to the bone structures. So it's known that heterogeneous application of modulus values based on CT image intensity is important in skeletal finite element modeling. 
And there's widespread use of the bone mat, algorithm, bone mat algorithm, which was developed in Italy, which yields distinct material properties for individual elements based on the intensity of the CT voxels composing that element. But alternately, voxels mapped to the vicinity of nodes of each element can be assigned individual values. However, both surface nodes and elements may lie within regions which are corrupted by partial volume effects. And this is something we had to deal with. Partial volume effects result in blurring of intensity values at boundaries with sharp intensity transitions, where the imaging system's resolution is unable to resolve the outline of the thin high intensity structures. So we know that materials of heterogeneous intensities, so if you're going from air to cortical bone, may be enclosed by a single element. So this element's density, if calculated by averaging the enclosed voxels, results in a value equivalent to soft tissue or low apparent density trabecular bone. So to overcome this issue, some models employ shell elements at the surface, but this kind of simplification does not address the inability to sample and map the regional cortical bone density values on the FE mesh surfaces. So this schematic um, illustration of node and element surface positions is shown superimposed on a CT image slice and the segmented bony region, the orange area, with a close-up of annotated regions shown below. In this, the thickness of the partial volume layer to be corrected was determined. The partial volume layer refers to the number of voxel layers on the segmentation surface that are suspected to be corrupted by blurring. All voxels whose distance from the surface were equal to or less than this PVL are removed and then reconstructed using Shepard's interpolation based on statistical characteristics of the inner voxels, which are presumed to be sufficiently far from the diffused boundaries so as not to be PV corrupted. So here's a, a, a slide showing the application of the surface partial volume effects correction algorithm with node-based application of material properties. And it enables an infinite spectrum of intensity values and distribution of properties within each element. And that's critical for representing very thin bone structures. So now we can take this CT intensity data and we can convert it to density through use of the Hounsfield unit to apparent density relationship determined using bone mineral phantoms in the clinical CT images. But many relationships exist describing the relationship between density and modulus for bone, but there was limited data for the craniomaxillofacial skeleton. Um, we were able to, to determine a CMFS-specific density isotropic elastic modulus relationship based on data from mapping the outer cortical table of the CMS um, using data from Peterson et al. So using this approach, the modulus assignment based on MMAP yielded modulus values reflected of a bone, including on the, mo mo uh, on the model surface. So here you can see, um, as comparison, their standard node or element-based analysis yields low partial volume affected moduli on the model surface. But here, on the when we use NMAP, you get a, a much more realistic with higher modulus values um, describing the cortical bone on the surface there. So using this methodology, we're then able to generate multiple FE models from cadaveric skulls using a consistent and unbiased approach, and that's really important. But with FE models, What's really important is that they also require experimental validation. So as such, mechanical testing was performed on the cadaveric specimens, instrumented with strain gauges, and loaded through two muscles independently um, through the temporalis and, and the masseter. So we found interspecimen consistency in these five specimens, which supports the use of the experimental model for validation of the specimen-specific craniomaxillofacial finite element models. So shown here are the results of the orthogonal regression analysis of the aggregate of all the FE predicted strains correlated with the strains measured in vitro, inclusive, inclusive of all the loading conditions. And it got a really high R value of 0.93, had a, a slope very close to one. Um, and critical to this excellent correlation though, were accurate load and boundary condition representations. And the models are known to be highly sensitive to this. But remember, we, we did this all under single muscle loading. So it was really simplified loading um, conditions. But using these, we had validated models. So they were done under simplified single muscle loading, but it motivated the use of the models to understand the biomechanical behavior during more physiologic loading. So we then took a loading scenario that represented bilateral bite, and we applied it to one of the craniomaxillofacial models. So we took experimental data from Ruiz et al. and based on, which was you know, generated based on feedback control resultant bite force measurements 
and they were obtained with simultaneous electromyograms from 10 male volunteers. So as an initial validity screen of the results, bite force and TMJ joint reaction loads produced by the models were shown to be those com comparable to those by Ruiz et al. So here, these models showed tensile on the left and compressive on the right regions of the craniomaxillofacial skeleton under the bite force loading as determined from the validated FE model. So a closer up view of the maxillofacial skeleton shows important pathways of load transmission occurring through complex areas of the zygoma and orbital rim. So we can compare these FE model results, which are shown on the right, with compressive load-bearing structures identified with solid downward arrows and tensile trusses with dashed arrows to the proposed vertical load-bearing struts of the craniomaxillofacial um, skeleton as described by classic buttress theory. And classic buttress theory is what, what uh, plastic surgeons are trained with. This is, this is what they believe to be in terms of load patterns in, in the facial skeleton. So this information is really important because if load bearing, if the loads are not being transmitted the way clinicians think so, that may change how we treat surgically, you know, surgically treat diseased or injured faces. So some other work we did in this talking about the complexity of uh, the craniomaxillofacial skeleton is, you know, we've made a lot of simplifying assumptions. Um, and so we've looked at some of these. And one of them, for example, was evaluating the 3D morphology of craniomaxillofacial sutures. So sutures in the skull are open at birth, allowing the head to grow, and they're reported to close somewhere between 30 to 40 years of age on average. So in this work, we use micro CT imaging to evaluate 3D connectivity and show differences in structure across suture gaps. The results indicated two ways in which sutures could achieve closure, closure and mechanical stability. One is fusion by laying bone to connect adjacent sutures, surfaces, and interdigitation by forming bony projections. So while such articulations and thin bone structures in the human skeleton are understood to be fully fused by adulthood, we found this wasn't always the case, and some of the sutures remained partially open up to the seventh decade of age that we saw in some of our cadavers. Suture mechanical behavior also when we tested these was shown to be impacted by morphologic factors, whether it was interdigitation or connectivity that was really you know, trying to close these sutures, and that they could be optimized for regional loading within the craniomaxillofacial skeleton. So understanding the sensitivity of models to load and boundary conditions, we've also started to explore new methods to better represent muscle loading. So we've been able to use MR-based diffusion tensor imaging in combination with anatomical data to elucidate the fibers and fiber bundles associated with the muscles of mastication. And this is important to better represent the physiologic muscle anatomy. So what we've been able to do is integrating this data within FE models, and we believe it could better allow us to understand the impact of muscle activity on stress and strain distributions. However, the enormous size of the nonlinear models makes solving them even on supercomputers very challenging. And it also requires validation of the models under more physiologic loading, where the muscles connect the mid-face and jaw, and loading is done by, for example, by moving the jaw. So this slide shows the complex process we developed to integrate muscle modeling into the craniomaxillofacial skeletal models. Um, it requires CT acquisition, deblurring in the NMAT process as previously described. Additional MR imaging is needed to segment the muscle volumes, followed by diffusion tensor imaging to elucidate the muscle fibers and integrate these directions into the individual elements. And we also incorporated loading to represent more physiologic scenario of jaw opening rather than pulling on individual muscles. So for this, additional experimental validation was needed. But we also wanted to determine the impact just from a pure comp computational perspective, the impact of the integration of these complex muscles into the models. So we developed both models using the 3D mass of the 3D mass that are using the muscle volume and fiber directions, and then a more simplified model in which we used 2D link elements to represent the mo model, which is often how models are mu uh, muscles are modeled. So here we can see differences in the strain patterns focused on the zygoma, which are quite striking, with the 3D muscle geometries with integrated fiber directions much more reflective of the smoother patterns of physiologic loading. So the next step for these computational models, now that we have them, was really to utilize them to evaluate craniomaxillofacial reconstruction. 
So cranial maxillofacial trauma often results from motor vehicle accidents, military and sports-related injuries, and it can be disabling both functionally and psychosocially. In treating these injuries, accurate reduction and stabilization are required, which can accommodate relatively small bone fragments and complex morphologies in 3D space. However, the use of a large numbers of implants in attempting to achieve rigid fixation may occur at the expense of favorable biological conditions for healing. So conventional wisdom indicates that more rigid fixation provides for a greater chance of uneventful fracture healing. But under more careful consideration, we, it suggests that the minimum amount of stiffness to achieve immediate return to function and long-term return to pre-injury conditions may represent the optimal treatment option. And this is really a belief that's held by um, Dr. Jeff Yalkov, the plastic and reconstructive surgeon that I've been working on this for many times. He really believes that in his, um, in his field, over-engineering is really an issue. So, um, we propose if, if over-engineering and fixation of the CMFS is leading to higher levels of complications, could FE models help us to better plan fixation in regions with tensile loading? And maybe it could help us to spare application of plates and screws in areas stabilized by compressive forces. So we initially sought to use our models to assess the stability of the reconstructions of zygomatic fractures that clinically are often treated with mini plates at three sites through three separate incisions. So utilizing our FE models, we were able to study the mechanical behavior of the fractured craniomaxillofacial skeleton in the presence of fixation and identify the minimum amount of hardware that can potentially uh, stabilize this type of zygomatic fracture. So current fixation strategies, such as three-point zygomatic fracture fixation, based on the loading pattern of the CMFS, were shown to be over-engineered, with strain patterns more similar to the intact side with respect to load transmission found with the two plate configuration. In addition to developing the FE models, we also set up experimental tests on cadaveric specimens, which evaluated strain and displacement at the fracture sites under jaw opening with three, two and single plate fixation. There was a quite a bit of vari variability in displacement at the fracture sites, but all configurations demonstrated displacement that was below that which would be considered clinically important, suggesting that additional plating may not be necessary, and if avoidable, could reduce implant costs and uh, operative time. So the search for an ideal osteosynthetic technology for treating craniomaxillofacial skeletal trauma has been, for the most part, confined to two main concepts of fixation, hardware, so plates and screws, or glue. Hardware is designed for mechanical stabilization and strength, whereas glue characterizes a minimally invasive, extremely low profile osteosynthetic material. But both uh, technologies have significant shortcomings in reconstructing complex multi-fragment 3D thin bone structures. So for example, small plates and screws can be difficult to handle and result in significant morbidity as the result of surgical exposure required for their implementation the tissue destruction inherent in drilling into the bone, and the profile or amount of material required to affect stabilization. Furthermore, application of plates and screws is really limited to narrow regions of the facial skeleton where there's adequate bone density to facilitate screw purchase. These problems, in addition to hardware-related post-operative issues, which are not insignificant, such as painful and palpable plates, have resulted in high reported rates of reoperation for hardware removal. So while the high stiffness of current metallic implants can provide stability and allow fracture healing to occur, the rate of healing may be compromised by stress shielding at the site of healing. Current resorbable high hardware, which is out there, is cumbersome with high profiles that are undesirable in many craniomaxillofacial locations. And the usability of heat moldable plates in the OR is also, or also, has also been an impediment to clinical uptake. Now, when we think about glues, they really haven't found much utility in craniomaxillofacial reconstruction. As once a fragment is fixed at a single site and glued, it can't be manipulated to ensure reduction at additional sites. So, and also that the presence of glue within a fracture gap could also inhibit bone healing in some cases. So <laughs> what do we think about? Well, much like a shattered vase, Reconstruction of the craniomaxillofacial skeleton requires the simultaneous alignment and stabilization of multiple articulated fragments for successful reconstruction. 
So furthermore, these fragments generally must be accessed from different incisions and entry points in the facial soft tissues, often not simultaneously visible, making perfect anatomical alignment in 3D technically challenging. Tape can facilitate the temporary stabilization of multiple fragments with enough flexibility to adjust the alignment, so that's not possible with glues, and to perfect it prior to permanent rigid bonding of the fragments. As a surface bonding device, tape is less invasive than fixation hardware, and most importantly, it's not dependent on limited areas of dense bone, which are often not available in the facial skeleton if they've undergone a blast injury or a firearm injury, for example, and also in some disease states. Um, and those, you know, the areas of dense bone would be needed to ensure adequate rigid attachment of a screw if it was used. The flexibility of tape further allows wrapping and bonding to complex bony contours, yielding a more robust 3D matrix type versus linear stabilization. So we felt that a bone tape that would bond to the surface could be cut into virtually any shape, size, or pattern, is low profile, offers flexibility initially for anatomic alignment, but may be cured to rigidity, would be conceptually innovative in that it's neither fixation hardware nor glue and represents a new paradigm in craniomaxillofacial reconstruction. So this started a long time ago and in developing bone tape, we assembled a multidisciplinary group <coughs> with expertise in engineering, chemistry, material science and plastic surgery. And initial material optimization was conducted to get the desired clinical feel for the tape while maintaining required material properties. In vitro work was, was done to demonstrate biocompatibility of the bone tape with no cell toxicity from any of the components and mechanical characterization of the tape and tape bone interface. Preclinical testing was carried out on a series of rabbits progressing from ex vivo to in vivo non-survival to in vivo survival models. And we concurrently carried our workflow, uh, workflow analysis studies on cadaveric human heads, doing a head-to-head -head comparison with plates and screws fixing fractures on one side and bone tape friction fractures on the other. Limitations noted with the initial version of bone tape motivated our continued work and patents toward developing a novel bio-inspired adhesive and addressing commercial considerations, including scale-up manufacturing that would be needed. And we've recently finished some additional in vivo preclinical testing on a bone tape version two, um, which have been very promising, but it's unfortunately a bit premature premature to share the results with you here today because uh, not all of the animals are quite yet finished. So what does the future of bone tape look like? Well, a new company was started to continue the development and commercialization of bone tape, and the work has been supported by a combination of grant funding and investments with support from incubators such as H2I and Creative Destruction Labs. Um, Cohesis is the company that um, has been started and it's been successful in numerous pitch competitions, but there are many steps needed in the commercialization pathway to ultimately get this technology to the clinic. And I'm working with them in an academic capacity still um, to continue developing this, this novel idea of, of bone tape. So in the area of craniofacial reconstruction, another commercial partner we've been working with is, is Calavera Surgical Design which is a startup company developed at a Sunnybrook that uses clinical CT data to create patient-specific molds, which are used to form custom implants within the operating room for corrections of defects in the face and skull. And what's important to this is they're not making the patient-specific implants, they're just making molds. And then the, everything else is done within the, within the operative environment. And you can use devices from any company or mold, whatever mold material you want. So one of the things is, is in um, developing patient-specific implants, or in their case, the molds, implementation of our deblurring algorithm, which I described earlier, um, was integrated into Calavera's workflow. And what it's been able to do is enable large savings in the time and cost for Calavera's patient-specific implant generation. It drastically reduced operator time and the requirements of expertise in creating implant molds. Our current work is now utilizing machine learning to further improve this process. And as part of this initiative, we participated in what's called the Mackay Auto Implant Challenge. So this is an international challenge that was motivated by the clinical need for patient-specific skull restoration. <laughs> The challenge of the objective is to predict an implant shape that restores original pre-injury or pre-surgical shape of the skull and or facial skeleton. In essence, this represents a shape completion problem in which we attempt to predict the whole skull from a partial view. 
Shown here is the initial challenge data set. Um, and after pre-processing, including cropping, the standard skull volumes were remarkably consistent with, with a few notable exceptions. And the set was divided for training and validation and done in, in machine learning approaches to this. So we used a deep learning framework and it was fairly straightforward what we chose. It was a unit consisting of five levels, convolutional blocks beginning with eight filters and doubling the filters for each down level. The bottom or bottleneck layer was also a standard convolutional block and the up levels consisted of a transposed convolutional layer, skip concatenation and another convolutional block. The pipeline worked reasonably well, but not perfectly as shown here in the 10 cases from the challenge test set representing implants that were quite different in shape, position, and side, com size compared to the training data and main test set. So this was from 2020. Um, the challenge continued in 2021 and was split into three separate tasks. So task one was cranial implant design for diverse synthetic de defects. Task two was cranial implant design for real patient defects. And task three was improving the model generalization for cranial implant design. The organizer of the challenge provided two groups of skull, um, one, um, skull fix with uniform synthetic defects and skull break with more clinically represent, representative synthetic defects. The challenge data set consisted of three distinct test sets that corresponded with three separated task submissions. So most importantly, I think was task two, which was composed of skull geometry from craniotomy patients. So patients who had skull removal performed to facilitate brain surgery and for whom imaging was available prior to defect creation, providing excellent quality ground truth shape. Okay, so the, two 20, the 2021 improved pipeline consisted of cropping the skull to the skull uh, to the defect skull geometry, predicting um, of intact full skull geometry using a UNET style encoder decoder, binary subtraction of the predicted intact skull, and a defect skull to create a candidate implant. And this was followed by post processing or filtering. Changes in performance of the algorithm were investigated by varying the three stages within the workflow. So looking at the pre-processing, varying the data set used to train the unit, and varying the post-processing or filtering, looking at, for example, spherical, topological, or a unit-trained filtering network. So what we found was a zero cropping unit trained against the skull break data set with classical filtering was found to be the best all around performing algorithm. But no single algorithm combined uh, gave superior performance when considered against all test sets. So as expected, the data set used to train the model had a large influence on algorithm performance. This highlighted the importance of increased variability of implant shape and location found within the skull break data set in training algorithms for shape generation. The finding supports the overarching recent goal of the contest in the use of synthetic implant shapes combined with limited clinical data to develop algorithms suitable for generating implant shapes in skulls with defects. So when we look at task two, and these were the actual clinical patients, um, it really, the, the results from the, from the uh, competition had generally poor dice scores. So although some cases yielded reasonable results when qualitatively judged by their appearance, other cases when visualized were shown to have completely failed with respect to shape and location. So you can see in the red arrows. Um, <coughs> other implants seemed to yield good agreement, but there were not actually feasible implants, as can be seen on the sagittal cross section shown at the bottom there, um, where there looks to be accurate implant prediction, but it's not clinically usable because the posterior inferior margin prevents that um, implant from ever being able to be um, put into or inserted into the defect. But we really believe that as further skull data sets are created, the quality and robustness of these generation algorithms will continue to improve. And so progress is ongoing to curate and share hundreds more head CT scans from the cancer imaging archives towards improving the performance of skull shape training. Additional patient-specific metadata for age and sex can be used to further improve prediction accuracy as available in this cancer imaging archive data, for example, and data from our own clinical experience at Sunnybrook. And we've, we've really made recent progress in this regard. So it's not only the underlying skull that's critical in craniomaxillofacial reconstruction, so as such, our more recent work has extended our scope to soft tissue facial structures. So in this, and Zach will talk a lot more about this later, because uh, it's really his work, we've worked to develop a CAD-CAM pipeline that considers both the face and the underlying skeletal anatomy. 
So an opportunity exists for preoperative treatment planning for cranial maxillofacial reconstruction in the digital age to generate 3D reconstructions and computer-aided designs that can be translated to the physical space to guide surgeons interoperatively. So also in this context, outside of the Mackay Challenge, the work we've been doing is creating um, data from publicly available large CT data sets with a good variability of age, sex, BMI, and ethnicity. Leveraging AI and this availability of data, we've been working to des design a skull face shape model that can predict the shape of a person's face from an image of their skull, for which example would be important in forensics, and conversely estimate the shape of their skull based on 3D surface image of their face, which may have a role where severe facial reconstruction is required. So ultimately, such a skull face shape model could provide a surgeon with the ability to see the final or desired outcome in facial surface morphology and derive skeletal manipulation required to achieve that outcome. Such a surgical planning tool would have a wide range of direct clinical applications in facial reconstruction, after trauma, ablative cancer surgery, cosmetic facial rejuvenation. But one of the challenges for facial shape prediction is the impact of demographic factors like BMI, not surprisingly, age, sex, and ethnicity on facial geometries. In this, it's known that different um, distinct face, face regions have a, distance, a different sensitivity to demographic data. So for example, regions like the cheeks are more sensitive to BMI or a patient's weight than the forehead. So this suggests that model performance might vary in different regions of the face. So our initial work for this application, we developed a unit composed of convolution blocks with ReLU activation and batch normalization, followed by a max pooling layer to reduce the number of weights. The synthesis path takes advantage of mirroring input layers by concatenating the corresponding contraction layer to the current convolution to feed into each block. The demographic data then is added to the model as additional features in the bottleneck layer of the UNET. When the soft tissue binary map is the target of the model, the bone binary map is used as an input and vice versa. Results from our initial pipeline are shown at the bottom of the slide with the predicted facial shape based only on the input of a skull CT image and demographic data on the left with the actual surface of each head shown on the right from CT imaging. So there's more work to be done, but you can see the, the general gist of what these faces look like um, is coming through. Finally, um, and I'll, I'll end in just a minute, in considering facial soft tissue, consideration is needed with respect to cartilaginous component and nasal reconstruction. So cartilage, which provides the foundational structure and support to the nose, is often deficient. And as such, currently struts from costal or rib cartilage are used to recreate the central L-strut support and other portions of the nasal septo um, cartilage, cartilaginous framework through a labor-intensive manual carving approach. So the surgeons go in and they, they harvest cartilage tissue from a patient's ribs um, or potentially from a human donor. Um, however, a major disadvantage of using costal cartilage in nasal reconstruction is its tendency to work. And so currently we're working to characterize the structure of costal cartilage, looking at microstructural collagen fiber orientation and proteoglycan distribution towards understanding their impact on mechanical warping. And so shown here is some of our earlier 3D tactography generated from MR-based diffusion weighted imaging through which can be used to visualize the collagen anisotropy in the tissue. Um, <coughs> and we've actually recently got some much better um, results for being able to see this, but it, these, these scans take a long time and they're very intense. But in, ten, in attempt to understanding these unbalanced forces that lead to the warping of struts cut from costal cartilage, we've been considering the potential effects of physical interventions, be the chemical, mechanical, or thermal to reduce costal cartilage work. So Dr. Grant and Dr. Moale gave us some excellent ideas to pursue with respect to, um, to this issue. Um, and what they, what they suggested was that in the potential for equilibrating the cartilage in a hyperosmotic solution in an effort to balance the internal stresses from swelling cartilage, and that may help to reduce warp. So in this, it's important to consider not only how the tissue may change in a hypo, hyper or hypotonic solution, but how a relaxed state may influence the cutting of struts and how ultimately replacing that hyperosmotic solution with isotonic saline could impact the final state. So we need to understand is an osmolarity test a reversible physical intervention that can be used to re reduce warp in cartilage struts without compromising its structural mechanical properties. 
Um, concurrently, we're working on an existing need for developing safe and effective cost of costal cartilage graft cutting tools to use in the operating room that can maximize tissue uh, usability. So right now, the device that they're actually using at Sunnybrook, I'm surprised surgeons haven't cut their fingers off. Um, and so there's a lot of work if we can if we can do this. And right now, you know, from each individual, if they're getting some allograft rib, all they can do is use one slice in the middle of that rib um, cartilage to to as an implant. And um, so there's there's a real lack of tissue available. And so if we can come up with a solution to this to make more of it usable by dealing with the warp issue, there's really a, a lot of opportunity. So I'm going to end my presentation here, but before I do, I have to note that I certainly did not do all of this work on my own, and I want to acknowledge trainees and staff in the OBL who worked on these projects, specifically Asma Malul, Amir Pakdel, Michael Hardesty, Hannah Arjman, James Mainprize, Hamza Maddy, and Zach Fishman, who you'll hear from soon, as well as many collaborators, including Cohesis and Calavera, plastic and reconstructive surgeons Jeff Fialkov and Ole Antonishin, and bioengineer Paul Santer, and the funding agencies who have supported the research. So thanks so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wow, that's a really wonderful work, um, uh, Carrie, really wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, any questions, sir? Please uh, feel free to just... Uh, Hi, Dr. Wein. Uh, Anthony here. I'm also in orthopedic surgery. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it's absolutely impressive, the breadth of your research, but also the depth in each area and what you're able to do. So on behalf of all orthopedic surgeons, thank you for your work. Um, in your second to last uh, project where based on a skull CT, you try to predict the face and you said you add the age and demographic information just after the bottleneck layer. I was wondering, is it sorry, the bottleneck layer itself that's updated with that information or is it just after that that information is incorporated? So it's it's just after where they're incorporating that information, but they've tried a number of different options. And as you can see, it's not perfect yet. Um, but yeah. we, and, and also a lot of the data sets don't have that information. So it's it's more, it's, it's difficult uh, because you want as much data as possible, but you don't necessarily have as much data um, with all of that demographic data. Um, so right now that's what they're doing, but um, I think there's still a lot more work that that's going to be done to improve that model. Okay, thanks. And, and it and also about works better the one way than the other right now. So we're doing much better job right now. The model's working better from face, from skull to face. Um, and there's challenges going from face to skull. And that's basically with the pre-processing step because you need a surface, like a closed in surface for it to go to. And so there's work that needs to be done to close in the surface of the skull to allow it to be um, uh, a, a surface to kind of project to. Um, and so mm -hmm. that's a, a challenge that we're still, that we're still uh, working to address. Okay, thanks. And a follow-up question on one of the different projects, the one where, you're trying to optimize the resolution of thin cut bones and determine whether voxels are air or not. You know, the fact that there's a few millimeters of space between the slices or that, you know, hallucinations are a so-called problem where you try to go from low res to higher res in, in some of these images. How have you dealt uh, with that aspect? Yeah, so so it does it does deal with the slice thickness issue. So it works when, even when you don't have isotropic voxel sizes. And so we did similar application of this, not just in the craniofacial skeleton, but also in the femur. So that might be more of interest to you um, in the proximal <laughs> femur. And we're able to show there also because you have the really you know the thin cortical bone layer over the um, trabecular centrum there in the in the in the proximal femur. And so we we're able to show there we got the same type of improvement uh, from the deep blurring process and looking at then um, dealing with these partial volume effects. Um, so, um, you know, I think it, it works um, both in plane and out of plane. And what's important is that you're developing these, this PSF um, um, estimate is, is based on that scan. So it's not a global PSF, it's based on the image that you get. And so you can actually calculate the PSF from the scan that you're taking. Okay, so from an area where you know you have just a, a thin piece of cortical bone, so in the mm -hmm. facial skeleton, that's easy, but also you could do it from um, 
you know, the, 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 the shaft of the bone. And so that, that can give you the PSF that you're working with. And then you utilize that in a, in a patient or image specific manner to then do the deblurring process and, and, um, and all the subsequent steps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Sorry. Um, the really innovative is uh, bone tape. Um, so do, do the fragments have to be, so you have to realign the fragments. Is that it? Yeah, so the fragments are always realigned um, or generally um, when they're doing surgery, they're, they're going to cut, they cut, you know, very small incisions. So they'll cut like three small incisions and they go in and they, in a minimally invasive manner or, or as minimally invasive as they can, they realign the fragments and then they'll put in plates and screws. And so in this, you, again, you'll realign those fragments, but instead of having to drill and then put in plates and screws, you just adhere, um, you adhere tape. And the thing about tape is, so let's say you, you know, you fix one, one fragment and then you fix the other fragment, there's still a little bit of give so that that third fragment, that third area can be, can be uh, aligned. Now, the other thing that you get with tape, that's a, that's an opportunity is that if you have a very small fragment too, you could tape it on there. Whereas before, you know, they may just be take, taken out or, or not, or just left hanging because you couldn't get a screw into those small fragments. So tape offers a whole variety of opportunity um, to kind of change the workflow as well in, in um, cranial maxillofacial reconstruction. Okay. So do you have to remove the tape afterwards? What, what's the No, tape? it biodegrades. Okay. What, yeah. what is it made of? Um, so I can't really talk about it at this time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, so they've they've submitted some patents, but there's still other other um, confidential, I guess, uh, research going on. So our initial work um, <laughs> was actually a biphasic construct where we used. Um, um, and, and it wasn't a it wasn't a realistic um, approach that we use. So we had a mineral phase in there that allowed, like in a um, so we had little pieces of of of, of um, calcium phosphate in there that allowed us to integrate, and we used bone cement to then attach that to the bone. And then there was a polymer part that that diffused through this porous calcium phosphate, and then we we would attach it that way. But it was never a, it was just a proof of concept that original bone tape. And so the second um, uh, reinvention of bone tape is really it's there's there's no mineral phase at all and it's kind of this bio inspired adhesive idea um, and it we've worked with Ellie Stone who maybe you know at University of Toronto who does lots of work um, you know with um, muscles <laughs> muscles that are muscle not muscles of the musculoskeletal system but like muscles in like shellfish um, and, and understanding in a bio-inspired way how, um, you know, how you can stick things very well to hard surfaces. And so it's really using this more bio-inspired technology to, um, to adhere uh, the, the bone tape to the bone now, and there's no mineral phase in it anymore. And so it, it also makes it less complicated when we think about the the degradation process as the tape um, degrades over time and we don't know how quickly that happens exactly yet because the rabbits are still alive so we're doing those long-term studies um and they're and um and we're taking them all the way out to i think it's 12 months or so or it's it's or maybe it's 24 weeks or 12 anyway it's a long time um and the, the rabbits are still going wonderful that's brilliant it's been an exciting journey. Um, and, you know, we first got funded by the Department of Defense and they had these um, these high risk, high reward grants that you'd hidden any, any preliminary data. You just needed a novel, innovative idea. And it was really great that they were able to we said, you know, we want to do this. And they and they gave us some money to do that. And that's what started this whole journey. And it's been great to think about, you have this idea, it's kind of a neat concept. And it just came out, I was sitting in a room with Jeff Fialkov and one of the fellows, and they were complaining about, you know, the, the options they have for fixing these fractures. And it was really just, you know, chatting. And this was 
you know, maybe 10 years ago um, <laughs> about how we could do this differently. And, you know, I'm not a biomaterials person. So I was like, oh, tape, you know, whatever. This is great. But how? and then we all said, so how are we going to do this? And um, and I said, hmm. and they look at me and I'm like, yeah, I don't really know. Um, I do more biomechanics once the tissue is there. So I was um, meeting with Paul Santerre, who was head of uh, biomedical engineering at, at U of T at that time. And in the meeting, and I was meeting him with him for a different purpose. And I said to him, by the way, we have this really neat idea. And I was wondering who, you know, is there someone in bioengineering that that I don't really know of that might be interested in this and that you could, you know, lead me to? And he said, oh, I'm interested in this. And so it's amazing how fortuitous things come that you just, you reach out to people like I reach out to you guys, you know, we, we have this cartilage issue. <laughs> you know, I reach out to people who have the expertise um, and that's, you know, putting these high performing teams together allows us to kind of then take this pathway and take an idea and, and translate it into something that hopefully, um, you know, my, my ideal is always that these things get used clinically um, and, and really transform patient care. Yeah, that's uh, really brilliant, really. Um, so I, can you comment on uh, uh, how that jives with the forces that act on the facial skeleton? I don't know about the forces so, that act. So that's, so that's great because the forces are not that high on the facial skeleton. Okay. And that's why we drive bone tape for that. So are you going to use this bone tape to fix your femur? No, <laughs> it's not, it's not going to be sufficient, but you know, it may have other opportunities um, as a temporary stabilization, for example, in complex pelvic fractures before you put those, um, you know, the, the stabilizing rods in or plates on. Um, okay. But really it's only, it's, it's not going to take high force, but the, but the issue is, is even so when they, when they stabilize these people are on a soft food diet as they heal. Like there are not high forces that you're feeling in the craniofacial skeleton, especially when they're healing and they're, they're in pain. So they're not wanting to eat, you know, almonds or steak. They're, they're, they're eating, you know, soft foods. And so the, the actual loads and understanding how those loads transmit and seeing that in some cases they're compressive loads, there's nothing pulling the, the bone apart that we don't maybe don't even need stabilization at all in some of those locations. And so wow. I think that's really important to understand. That's really great. It's nice to see serendipity meet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's really wonderful. Uh, so I know other... it was maybe more computational than uh, than some of the talks in this, this section, but I think you knew that was coming uh, when you invited me to speak. Yes, yes. I learned about the classic buttress theory, for example. <laughs> yeah, that's really wonderful. Any other questions? Uh, uh, before we move to the next speaker. Dr. Uh, Raul has his hand up. <laughs> Raul, please. Raul. Yeah. Hi, Kelly. Amazing talk as always. Just had a quick question for you. Since you're talking about this take that can immobilize cranial sutures and cranial bones, do you see an application in rib fractures? Because paradoxical breathing and rib trauma is a very common thing that when you exhale, your rib actually goes down. So it's called paradoxical breathing. So maybe because right now we do skin tapings to be able to uh, stabilize that fragment. Do you yeah. think an application in that high pressure airway? Well, the that problem high is we need low, we need low force environments. So it depends. And I, you know, I haven't studied it. We need to understand the loading scenario that you're going to put this tape into. So is there an opportunity? Potentially, but we really have to. I believe, look at the biomechanics, understand the low transmission patterns. And that's what we've been doing for many years. And that's why I think we felt comfortable to say, hey, the facial skeleton, this makes sense because we don't have these. So other people have said, are there, you know, places in the wrist or other, other bones in the body where, again, maybe the loads aren't as high that there could be potential uses for this. And so, you know, I don't know enough about the load transmission there um, to know how, you know, if you cough, is the, is it gonna, is it bust apart? You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's, that's what we really have to understand is what, what those loads are. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, Mike? 
Yeah, no, wonderful work, uh, Dr. Wine. Amazing modeling. It's incredible to see it. Uh, and the development of the tape has a pretty cool concept. I like the idea that you said you transition out of the calcium phosphate, I guess, because uh, I, I would imagine the contact with some soft tissue, it, it, uh, I'm not sure, but it, it may do some sort of calcification there. But uh, that's pretty incredible that, uh, that you have that second version coming out. I was, I was curious about your modeling. So you have... Um, it's it, the modeling is incredible for for the cranial facial area, the the surface that is, and, and the prediction and the machine learning that work pretty well, and it, it seems to be improving quite fast as as you develop it further. How does it work? For, like your the learning system work very well for for improving the visualization in internally to more with deeper within the cranial facial area. So how does your model work for predicting, let's say, injury or trauma within? the deeper areas of uh, the skull. Yeah, we have really looked, like we've mostly been focused on zygomatic fractures um, because mm -hmm. clinically that was the area that, that's that's most important. Um, we have used um, the same methodologies though with the machine learning stuff um, to look at the orbital floor. So orbital floor fractures. And so those are very thin, you know, um, and when they're putting replacements in there, what we found was a lot of it is not just the shape of, of the orbital floor um, that you're trying to recreate, but actually the positioning of it in there and how you uh, integrate positioning of the orbital floor in, in the reconstruction, because even small alterations in that um, mm -hmm. cause a problem. And so what's important in developing implant, I don't know if this is exactly answering your question, but in developing implants for that, what you need to do is index them well, so that the actual implant can only fit in one they may be a bit bigger, but they can only fit in one direction and in one in one orientation, because otherwise, you know, there's 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 you're you're losing all of this patient specific, um, you know, potential by having it oriented wrong. And it becomes really important in the orbital floor because, of course, your eyeballs are there and your vision is affected, affected by it. So, you know, I think it's still hard, like our models. To, to look at the really thin bone structures like the sinus and all of that, they're still very thin and you don't have a lot of elements mm -hmm. through them. So to say, oh, well, you know, these are the, the stresses or strains there is, is a harder sell in some ways um, because of the size. I think it still allows that transmission so you get a better understanding of, of what's going on in the zygoma and you get, um, you know, an, uh, uh, you know, an easier way of developing these models where you don't have holes and you're not manually trying to fix everything. But the actual load transmission through those is tough. And so, you know, how much does it matter? We don't know. Um, you know, those those thin, those thin structures, is it really about load transmission or or is it serving another purpose? For example, to hold up the eyes or in the sinuses to, you know, divide up cavities. Um, and so I think those are interesting questions that still need to be looked at. I think we're doing a little bit less finite element modeling now as well. They're getting so complicated and so challenging, especially the latest ones that, that Hannah had been working on, that um, you know it's untenable, really, the translation of them. And so where can machine learning pick up where you know once you train the model, you need a lot of data that <clears throat> they're much more rapid and they can give some great understanding. And so I think we're still trying to balance. We're doing both, but we're still trying to balance in a computational scenario. What do we want to be doing and what do we want to be looking at? Because, you know, we built five patient specific models. That's forever. Like that's a lot of work. And then even, you know, building these few more with these, this DTI and MR, I mean, that was even more, you know, time consuming. And so when we think about that, you know, where do we go from here? We can't keep putting more and more complexity onto these models, they become untenable. And so we need to think about different ways of approaching computational modeling and thinking about using the right tool for the right question at the right time. That's perfect. Uh, well, really thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So I think we're going to move to uh, Dr. Zachary Fishman. Um, so we can hear more about uh, uh, Zachary. I'm sharing my screen now. Okay. Everyone can see that? Yeah, thanks. Full view. Um, 
I'll try and go fast because we had a few great questions uh, if we're still ending at 2.30. Um, so, uh, as Carrie mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in her lab. And uh, we're an orthopedic biomechanics lab, but working closely with uh, plastic surgeons. Uh, my workflow, my work has, and research has uh, involved more soft tissue because uh, the, the face um, uh, has the skeletal substructure of the skull and, and the soft tissue is our outside appearance. Um, and my research from my PhD has been towards improving workflow and accuracy in cranial facial reconstruction with new computer assisted surgical planning. Um, next slide. So, uh, in cranial facial reconstruction, uh, the surgeons are seek, seek to have 3D shape information to help improve their patient specific planning. And this is often unavailable because you don't have a CT or an MRI scan from before you're injured, uh, or from before, um, uh, facial trauma. And it's especially a problem in bilateral, uh, trauma issues or resection cases where you can't mirror the 3D information from the good side to the uh, contralateral side, uh, such as uh, panfacial traumas. And especially my research is focused on nasal defects where the nose is a complex 3D shape that's right in the middle of the mirroring plate. So traditionally, a uh, plastic surgeon would receive personal photos from a patient and use those as a visual reference in surgery, but they don't provide any uh, great information because it's a flat 2D image, and the surgeon has to use their visualization skills to try and understand and estimate what a face shape might be from a 2D photo. But with new technologies that have come out for computer-assisted design and manufacturing, uh, we've proposed a new workflow where that those collection of patient photos from before uh, trauma or resection can be provided for analysis with a tool called 3D morphological models to estimate a 3D face from a 2D photo. And then if you're smiling in a photo, uh, we need to account for things like expression uh, uh, to neutralize the expression if you're under anesthesia in, on the operating table and tying back to orthopedics, uh, how the outside of the face relates to the underlying skull, we look towards forensics data with tissue depth data to relate the face surface to the skull surface. Uh, but for today's talk, I'll be focusing just on the outside of the face, um, going from a 2D photo to a 3D estimate, and how we evaluated that with 3D scan data. And then it, once we have the 3D scan, uh, a clinical example of how we can use that as applied to nasal reconstruction templates. So a uh, 3D morphable face model is a, uh, is a field of research that uh, is being applied for everything from emotion recognition to uh, the computer uh, generated images in movie industry. And these are built from a database of 3D face shapes that are averaged together to understand the averaged and standard deviation uh, of a population set, and computer vision can leverage this from a, a photo by landmarking and identifying uh, the facial po landmark points on a photo, and then morphing that uh, 3D face to the photo to try and get a patient-specific um, 3D estimate of from a picture. But in plastic surgery, we have a high demand of accuracy, and so we need to uh, independently validate these models to see if we can use them for our application. So here's an example of two subjects from my research, where on the left here, you see 2D photos of a subject. In the middle is the 3D scan of the subject uh, at that same instance of the photo. And this is an example from the basal face morphable model, where it's a 3D estimate uh, based on that 2D photo. And in the published works about the models, they might provide an average error across the face. But one contribution we've provided is breaking up the face into regions because we care if we're reconstructing a, a forehead frontal bone versus a jaw and mandible to not just have an average error, but to know the distribution of that error. And we've also um, done racial bias. Uh, analysis. And in this example, you see a relatively low error um, on this Caucasian female face, but on this East Asian female, 
uh, this high error nose is what you would result would be a result of predicting a Caucasian nose on an Asian face. And uh, the, that also illustrates the importance of breaking up your face into regions because this might have a low error overall. But uh, you, if you're doing a nasal reconstruction, uh, that's just not going to work well. And uh, that, those were two example subjects, but this is what the analysis looks like on the rest of the facial, uh, 3D facial database, where for 51 subjects, uh, you see all regions having a pretty tight average error around 2.5 millimeters. But for the East Asian subjects, a much uh, worse error, especially for the nose, around five millimeters. Um, and the, only these two racial groups in this 3D database had enough uh, subjects to provide a subgroup analysis. Um, but you can see the importance of having a uh, uh, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, diverse training set in your data uh, because it can result in uh, racial bias like this. And this basal face model that we did this analysis is already a few years old, and, and I'm happy to say that since then, uh, new machine learning approaches uh, with more diverse data in them seems to have solved this problem and, and can predict uh, racially diverse um, uh, face shape data. And something we're working on now is also accounting for age uh, bias, because a lot of these databases are built off of uh, subjects who have been scanned in the 20 to 40 year old range. Uh, but the patients who are coming for tumor resection on their face are, are much older than 40 years old, for example. So with a 3D face estimate, um, the surgeons came back to us with feedback saying, this is great, uh, a 3D face on the computer screen, but give us something we can use in the operating room. So we brainstormed with them and came up with this application uh, of applying a 3D face estimate to forehead flaps for nasal reconstruction, which is where a, a template will be traced on an existing nose uh, and used to transfer uh, that shape, flattened it onto the forehead for a skin graft to create a patient-specific nose graft to reconstruct a nasal shape. Uh, however, this can be manual, uh, time-consuming interoperatively, and as with the bilateral uh, cases I showed before, it requires having a unilateral defect to mirror compared to a bilateral defect where you might not have that information. So we proposed a new 3D uh, CAD and CAM pipeline of taking a 3D nose shape and helping uh, to do preoperative planning to figure out what the 2D skin flap shape should look like. And we turned to non-clinical software, uh, actually also free software called Autodesk MatchMisser, which has a tool called Unwrapping. And that is a tool uh, used for diverse applications. And you can picture in the upholstery industry, trying to figure out how much fabric you need to drape over a chair. And there's a few different features in there, which uh, can affect how much deformation you have to go from 3D to 2D. So if you have uh, a full unwrapping, or you can unwrap by different subgroups of the 3D surface to minimize that deformation. And the analogy I like here is how you unwrap a spherical globe into a 2D map. And this is a, a well-known issue with unwrapping uh, or flattening a, a 3D shape where you can wind up with deformed um, uh, surface area uh, like Greenland um, being too large. Um, and uh, by analogy, there's other uh, orange peel maps which include um, uh, slits or, or breaks in the shape, 3D shape, which allow deformation to unwrap uh, with a more accurate size. So coming back to the nose, uh, we have a 3D nose and we've divided it up into the aesthetic subunit regions so that we're trying to minimize the deformation of the nasal, nasal tip region and the columella because like the globe, that's a, a hemisphere is your nose tip. And so that's where uh, there's more deformation. And by dividing it by groups, we've controlled uh, and improved the, uh, minimize the deformation of the nose tip. And for testing and validation, we can 3D print a patient-specific nose 
and print a one-to-one -one scale uh, with a really cost-effective uh, office printer to print a template on paper, and then can practice folding that in preoperatively uh, to test our plan. So the surgeons were so excited by this workflow, uh, we jumped into a case series to study this um, uh, improved CAD and CAM workflow. And this involved five patients with uh, different uh, extensive rhinectomy and 3D scanning. Uh, the patient pictured here had their 3D uh, nose intact enough that we could 3D scan it. We mirrored it to try and restore some symmetry, labeled it, and flattened it into a template on paper, and then that was traced onto a metal foil, which could be sterilized to bring into the operating room, uh, translated onto the forehead to, um, to excise that skin for a graft, and then turned and sutured in. And here you see the plastic surgery um, after image. And this patient really shows the overall workflow we've been describing, where it's a complete rhinectomy case with no previous 3D shape information of their nose, but we have a picture of what they used to look like, a 3D estimate based off of that picture uh, to get the 3D nose shape from a CT scan of their um, of their post section, uh, we can estimate how much of the nose needs to fit back in and then template that to uh, fit into the shape. And uh, with regard to the significance of preoperative planning and saving interoperative time, uh, similar work out of, I think, South Korea uh, did a, a similar preoperative planning with 3D printing, but not with the unwrapping part that we uh, added as a novel contribution. And they found about 25 minutes were saved in the operating room by doing this preoperatively. And from another paper with an estimate of uh, operating room costs per minute, uh, this preoperative planning could save about $1,200 of interoperative time. So overall, uh, we've developed new algorithms and validated uh, non-clinical software for new clinical use uh, to try and improve interoperative planning and uh, preoperative uh, tools. Uh, the forehead flap templates was a case study with five rhinectomy cases to develop and illustrate new CAD CAM technologies. And it's, in essence, it went from 2D to 3D back to 2D to go from a picture to a, a face shape back to a, a skin graft. And these new uh, patient-specific workflows can complement uh, the surgeon's existing workflows to save intraoperative time. I uh, would like to thank our funding sources and partners, of course, and uh, happy to have any questions if uh, we go a bit past the 2.30 time. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Zach. Um, questions? So, so what does this uh, construction of the 3D morphable models, uh, so you, you, you have you have acquire the data, and then you do registration, what does it involve? More? Yeah, um, so the, the morphable models built from databases of, of hundreds or thousands of 3D faces, uh, the 3D scans are uh, registered together and then deformably registered to bring those 3D meshes into correspondence, it's called. So all the meshes are the same across all the faces. And then um, you can average them and it, uh, principal component analysis lets you understand the variance of the different shapes. And you can have different, um, different principal um, components to understand like width, length, uh, large noses, small noses, um, or and the, try and cover the variety of, of the human face shape. Um, and then as it's applied to the image, uh, the image is uh, a face is detected in the image, uh, 2D landmarks can be placed on the face, and then those 3D landmarks can be morphed to the 2D landmarks to try and match them um, in the traditional sense. And now new machine learning approaches have also been uh, added to that to try and really increase the accuracy. Okay, that's great. So it, it sounds uh, labor intensive. <laughs> um, well, thankfully, uh, a lot of other great research labs have, have worked on these problems. 
and we're not developing the machine, the morphable model. We're just trying to use it for a new application, um, which is where our validation was was critical because you know, we can't just assume uh, low error because another group says so. We need to, we're making sure to validate it for ourselves and to test out um, uh, racial bias and age bias as, as uh, clinical cases may require. Thanks, uh, Raul. I agree. Uh, amazing talk. I just had a Thank quick follow-up question. Like back in another life, and I was rotating in forensics, we had this software. It's more advanced now for facial reconstruction and predictive modeling, and how a person will look when we see those pictures on milk cartons. And uh, they were also using it for uh, partial decomposed bodies that we will find, and how to match it to the existing database or make a composite sketch. So, is this model any way? I mean, what is the advantage of using? this technology rather than developing that is an existing platform. And can it do predictive modeling too, like based on post-op reconstruction or where do you see its advantage lying? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the question. Uh, we've definitely uh, in, uh, appreciated the, the forensics field from the plastic surgery field because we were looking for facial soft, soft tissue depth information and found forensics had already done a lot of this. Um, and, and we uh, call it our work reverse engineering forensics sometimes, because if forensics is finding a skull and trying to figure out what a face looks like, we're trying to go backwards. If we can, we, we've termed it an outside in approach uh, where plastic surgery might be building, a, building up the bone to try and restore the face. If we're getting the face from a picture, we, we're then trying to go backwards to figure out what we need to do to the skull to make that face shape work. Um, so there's there's definitely uh, uh, coincidences and, and uh, research in both fields that we're trying to bring together. And uh, the the age variation uh, that you mentioned, um, there's even amazing like Instagram filters now that can artificially show you what you look like age. Uh, but what we're trying to also do is make sure things are, are realistic and patient specific. So having database to test on so that it's not just a, a simulation, but actually accurate. Great. And one follow-up question for that value in plastic surgery applications. Sometimes many people go for collagen fillers and it doesn't turn out very well in the end. Is there a way you can predict it like, how much collagen, if like simply injection, if someone was to say that if you put this filler in here, this is how you would look rather than going into repeat surgery. Is that something that it can be diversified into? Or mm -hmm. that that's um, definitely aligned with one of our application goals. Uh, and as Carrie showed before, the skull to face prediction from machine learning is tied in with that, where. Uh, we were looking at uh, bone onlays, where if someone has a cranial defect, they might also be missing their temporal muscles. So they, they try and figure out how much muscle um, to represent in the skull implant to add back. Uh, so not as cosmetic as collagen, but uh, the same idea as trying to figure out the missing pieces and the missing volumes uh, to try and restore a cosmetic and, and symmetric appearance. Thank you. Thank you, too. Any other questions? So if there are no more questions, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Fishman and Dr. Wine for such wonderful work, really. You gave us uh, really a nice, uh, uh, nice, wonderful story, translational. Uh, really, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending the meeting. And if you have any more questions, I think uh, you know where they are, Sunnybrook. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much for inviting us. We really appreciate the opportunity to speak to your group. So, Thanks for accepting. Thank yeah, we're very happy. <laughs> thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.